what should we expect from Glasgow and COP26 is the title uh, of our very timely webinar this morning. And it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, one and all uh, to our webinar uh, uh, about, about this critically important global event. Just as solving the climate crisis itself requires collaboration by everyone uh, in every country and every, uh, every uh, city, uh, this webinar is the product of collaboration within the, uh, the Columbia University community. It's been organized initially by the network of nine uh, Columbia Global Centers around the world, and principal capitals around the world, particularly uh, in uh, following the direction of the Global Center in Santiago, Chile, and its director, uh, Karen Poniacic, uh, who put this uh, uh, seminar, originally conceived of and put the, the webinar together. My name is Tom Trebot. I'm the director of the Columbia Global Center in Rio, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And I will be the moderator today uh, in that fortunate position. By the way, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, was signed here in the city of Rio de Janeiro in 1992, so almost uh, 30 years ago, an event worth, worth marking. And Rio de Janeiro remains one of the most uh, resilient uh, uh, global cities and maintains its uh, leadership role uh, at the local municipal level. Our three speakers, uh, Walter Betjen, John Furlow and Melody Brown, whom I will introduce a little more properly to you shortly, are associated with Columbia's International Research Institute for Climate and Society, or IRI, uh, which is part of the uh, iconic Earth Institute at, at Columbia University. IRI focuses on helping countries to adapt climate changes that are already happening, uh, such as uh, heat waves, droughts, and extreme storms. Uh, it works around the world, uh, but mainly focused on the agricultural sector and then on developing countries. It does critically important work uh, for those, those communities. We're also pleased uh, to partner with another Columbia um, uh, partner, the Global Columbia Collaboratory. The Collaboratory is a virtual exchange platform it's supported by Columbia Center for Global Undergraduate Global Engagement in partnership with the Columbia Global Centers and the Columbia World Projects. The, the Global Columbia Collaboratory brings students, thought leaders, and educators together to empower students uh, to make a difference in the world as global citizens, which they want to do and which we need them all to be. Uh, the collaboratory is designed to encourage students to reflect, to ideate, uh, and to collaborate to make a difference in the world. So we all uh, want to applaud them for that. Currently, uh, Columbia students are participating in the collaboratory from 23 different countries around the world, and they represent among them 30 uh, uh, disciplinary majors, many of them related to the subjects we'll, our panelists will be discussing this morning. Uh, we're pleased that over 300 that Columbia students have participated actively in the collaboratory since it was launched, launched mid-pandemic in the summer uh, of last year, including undergraduate students, observers, and uh, graduate students. Uh, Dean Shannon Marcus of the uh, UGE, uh, the Office of Undergraduate Global Engagement, and many of the current cohort of Columbia students are with us today. So, and especially warm welcome to them, to all of you, but to those students uh, in particular, some of whom will be and will have to be our future climate leaders. With that, let's turn to the substance of the webinar itself and get on uh, with uh, the presentations. Um, uh, the briefest uh, backgrounder is that from October 31st, I think as we all know, uh, through uh, November 12th, all eyes will be on Glasgow for the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP. 26 in the, uh, the Argot will be held. Uh, Glasgow is comes five years after the landmark 2015 Paris Agreement, more or less five years, uh, in which many countries agreed to voluntary pledges, no, with no real enforcement mechanisms, mechanisms, mind you, to cut their admissions. In UN speak, these uh, uh, voluntary pledges uh, uh, are referred to as nationally defined contributions or NDCs. So you may be hearing that acronym quite a bit. But will the conference participants in Glasgow, which include now President Biden, most notably uh, among global leaders, come to the table with new commitments that will keep uh, global warming, warming by the end of the century to 1.5 degrees centigrade or about 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit over pre-industrial levels? And how will countries reach intermediate goals, which are daunting, of uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 40% or so by 2030. So the clock is ticking there and then reaching net zero, uh, which is, means just what it says, carbon uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions targets by 2050. 
As one journalist put it recently, COP26 is not just one more. Uh, after 25 and before 27, not just one more meeting and a long running series of meetings often referred to by the whole city, such as Copenhagen, Paris, and now Glasgow. No other journalist put it, it's a real thing. This is not a drill. Uh, for John Kerry, who is the US climate ambassador and who led the US delegation to Paris in 2015 and does so again now in Glasgow over the weekend, it's our last best chance. So will the global community wake up to Glasgow in Glasgow and strengthen their commitments even beyond the announced pledges made in Paris? I'd be surprised. I think many of you would be as well. That's what must happen. This is not a drill. A painful transition, however, lies immediately ahead for us, for the world. We're not on some leisurely guide path, as the New York Times calls it, a leisurely glide path to lower admissions. And since Paris in 2015, in fact, global emissions have only increased to record levels, in fact, in 2019. And we're, we are all very familiar with the multiplicity of extreme weather events seemingly everywhere and all the time. Uh, before adjourning themselves to Glasgow over the weekend to join a large Columbia delegation there, our three colleagues from IRI, the International Research Institute for Climate and Society, are taking time uh, from packing to share their insights and expectations for this globally critical conference. We're so grateful to them for their generosity of time and their spirit of collaboration. I'm pleased to welcome them a little bit more properly now and then turn the floor over to them in, in, uh, for their initial statements. Our panelists are Walter Betchen. Uh, Walter is a senior research scientist and director of the Regional and Sectoral Research Program at IRI. At IRI. He's lent his considerable expertise in scientific research on climate and agriculture to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, another acronym handy to remember. And Walter has been a lead author or a contributor to many of the early IPCC reports, including the, the landmark IPCC report in 2007, which garnered a Nobel Prize uh, for the scientists involved in putting it together. Walter will address us today on the latest IPCC report from last August, the same report that UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres referred to as a quote unquote, code red for humanity. So, Dire, uh, a dire assessment. The next two speakers will provide us with their insider assessments of what will make Glasgow a success or a failure. John Furlow, who joins us today, uh, is a director of International Research Institute. He's a veteran, John is a veteran observer and participant in these COP meetings and offers us an extremely valuable long-term perspective. In his previous positions with the United States government, John designed and led the climate change adaptation program in USAID's climate change office. In 2015, as part of the U.S. delegation, he worked uh, with the Department of State in the United States to design and manage the National Adapt Adaptation Plan uh, Global Network. So it's a pleasure to have John here. And then John is joined, uh, and the two will share remarks about what to expect of Glasgow. It's joined by Melody Brown. Melody, welcome. As a, Melody is a senior staff associate at the IRI with a multidisciplinary educational background in uh, Earth science, uh, sustainable development, and adaptation uh, to climate change. I suspect that's a background similar to many of our students listening in this morning. Melody's work at IRI focuses on strategies to improve integration of climate information into decision making processes to increase preparedness, response, and resilience to climate impacts. And in various capacities, Melody has also participated in numerous previous COP meetings with a particular focus on the role of the poor countries these countries face the, the brunt of climate change uh, impacts. For some of them, those impacts are existential in nature. The logistics of the meeting, and then I'll, I'll, I'll step aside. I'd ask each of the speakers, please. So uh, Walter, beginning with you, then John, then, then Melody, for 10 to 15 minutes, Let's keep it within those, uh, that, those uh, yeah, intervals uh, of, um, uh, of opening remarks. Uh, then we'll, we'll follow that with 10 to 15 minutes of facilitated conversation, react to one another, maybe some, some comments by me. And then finally, that should leave us with a good 20 minutes or so of interaction with the audience via the Q&A function. And that's your role, those of, you, those of you calling in from many parts of the world, do your part, please, to, to contribute, to collaborate, to do your part to our joint learning exercise. Do your part by registering your questions as soon as they occur to you in the Q&A function. The speakers will look them over in the Q&A section and respond to many, as many of them 
as, as possible. So uh, without more from me, I'll, I'll step aside and I welcome uh, Walter to make uh, Walter Betchen. Uh, please, the stage is yours to address some of the basic science that makes this COP26 different from the preceding ones. Welcome, Walter. Thank you. Good day, everybody. And uh, thank you for the invitation and thank you for all the participants for being in this webinar. Uh, I promise I will not bore you with scientific stuff. I just want to, to give a, a very few, you know, concepts that I think are important for, for the COP26 and in general for discussing the climate change issue. And to start with that, I, I guess you, are you seeing my screen okay? Yes. Okay. So to, to start with that, let's remember why we have these uh, changes in climate, global warming, where, where this is coming from. First of all, we should remember there is a, a natural greenhouse effect in the planet. You have the sun emitting radiation, some of that radiation, that energy from the radiation is re-emitted to the atmosphere as heat. And when it's going to escape the atmosphere, it hits a layer of gases that have the ability to absorb that heat, some of that heat, and re-emit that heat down to the earth. This is a natural greenhouse effect. And if we didn't have that natural greenhouse effect, today we would have 10 or 15 degrees colder temperature. The main responsible gases for this natural greenhouse effect are carbon dioxide and water vapor. So this is natural. If we didn't have this, we wouldn't have life on planet. The problem is that in the last almost 300 years, humankind have been emitting a lot of these greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And now that layer is similar to being thicker. It's like having a, an actual greenhouse where the roof, where the glass on top is thicker. So now we are trapping more heat. We are re-emitting more heat and we have this global warming and these changes in climate. And so from this very elementary caricature, the conclusion is the problem is the emission of greenhouse gases. And the solution is to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases. Now, IPCC is the institution that congregates the scientific community working in climate change around the world. And every more or less five years, they produce a report with a state of the art. What is the state of the art technology in climate science, climate change? And the official assessment report number six will come up next year. But I'll tell you a few things that will be included in that report. One, you can read in that slide. There's already damages that we have caused to the climate system that have no going back, but there's some things that we can slow down and we can, we can limit warming. The other one, very important, is that it's undisputable that human activities are causing climate change. But this is a really important part of the statement. Making extreme climate events like heat waves, floods, droughts, more frequent and more severe. So what, what the report is saying is, we know already that the global warming has been creating more frequent and more intense extreme events. The projections are that those extreme events, droughts, floods, heat waves, in the future will be even more frequent and more intense. Now, what, what does that mean from a practical standpoint? What it means is that we should ask ourselves today, are we as societies well adapted to confront these extreme events? What happens in the developing countries when you have a flood, when you have a hurricane hitting a city, when you have 
uh, a drought hitting agricultural land. Clearly, developing countries are not well prepared and not well adapted to current climate. Now, that's developing countries. Think of New York. New York, one of the richest cities in one of the richest countries in the world. You get sandy, you get a bad storm, and it's a mess. Billions of dollars of losses. So if a rich country, a rich city is not well prepared to current climate, imagine the developing world. Now, what I think is that the, the scientific community has spent a lot of time in climate change studies trying to imagine what the climate will look like in 80 years from now, 70 years from now. What is the rainfall going to do in Brazil in 2050? What is it going to happen in Argentina with a temperature in 2080? Those climate change scenarios of the far future are good to raise awareness. It's giving a very strong message to the people saying, we have to change our business, or we will create changes in climate that are going to be really bad. But if you concentrate your efforts in developing scenarios for a moment in time, that is 50, 60, 80 years in the future, what decisions are you informing? What actual policies are you informing? Very little. In fact, the best recipe to ensure paralysis, to ensure doing nothing, is you provide a decision maker or a policy maker with information that is very far in the future and that is uncertain. Then you know for sure nothing's going to happen. And I think a lot of the work in the past has been concentrated in that effort. Let's try to guess with our best tools what the climate will look like in the future. So now the report is saying increased frequency and intensity of extreme events. That means concentrate in improving adaptation today. What can we do today? especially in developing countries, to improve adaptations to a climate that is valuable, that is having these extreme events more frequently and more intense. So that's one very important key message from the assessment report that will come up next year. The second very important message is, again, like in the previous five reports, the key issue here is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Now, what is the current situation today? This is a very simplified, uh, very simplified slide showing what are the sources of greenhouse gases. 73% of the greenhouse gas emissions come from the energy sector. 6% come from industrial processes, 12% from agriculture, 6% from land use changes, mainly deforestation, 3% from residues. But let me go back here. 73% of the greenhouse gases come from the energy. This is where we need to work, energy sector. Now, very shortly also, there, there are three green, as you saw in this, uh, in this simplified caricature of, of the emissions, there are three gases that are critical. Carbon dioxide, 74% of the total greenhouse gases, methane, and nitrous, nitrogen oxide. So those are the three greenhouse gases that matter. They have properties that are very different. The carbon dioxide, remember the greenhouse effect is because these gases can absorb heat and then re-emit heat. The carbon dioxide, by definition, has a global warming potential of one. That means that we will express the global warming potential of other greenhouse gases in relation to the CO2, to the carbon dioxide. So by definition, global warming potential of carbon dioxide is one. And the other important issue is how long does the gas stay in the atmosphere? In the case of CO2, it stays 1,000 years or more, which means that now, today, 
2021, we are still feeling the impacts of carbon that was emitted at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, in the 18th century. So once that you emit carbon dioxide, it stays there for a long, long time. Second gas, methane, much higher warming potential than the CO2, 30 times more. One kilo of methane can has a, a, the potential warming, global warming of 30 kilos, 28 kilos of dioxide. But it takes only 10 to 15 years in the atmosphere compared to 1,000 years of the CO2. The third gas, nitrous oxide. Much higher warming potential, almost 300 times more than CO2 and stays in the atmosphere for 100 years. Now, I'm going to go back to the assessment report, the sixth assessment report that will come next year. And I will concentrate in, the, in comparing these two gases, CO2 and methane. And let's think of three possible scenarios. One scenario in which both carbon dioxide and methane goes up, the emissions are increased. One scenario is a little bit better where emissions of both CO2 and methane are constant, so they don't increase, they don't, re they're not reduced, but they don't increase. And the best possible scenario where both gases emissions of those gases go down. What is the impact of these scenarios on the global temperature? What happens if both gases increase? This is what happens. This is the worst possible scenario. The effect of methane is proportional to the effect of the emissions because why? Because it stays in the atmosphere for a short time. But look at the effect of CO2. It's exponential. Why? because every time I emit one kilo of CO2, it's piling up to the kilos of CO2 that have been emitting in the last thousand years. So terrible scenario. Set a better scenario, we maintain the emissions constant. If we maintain the emissions constant, the temperature due to methane doesn't change. It doesn't get warmer, but it doesn't get colder. But with CO2, because we are continuing to emit, even at constant rate, we continue to add carbon to the atmosphere that will stay for a thousand years, still the temperature goes up. And what happens in the best possible scenario? Both gases go down. What happens is if we reduce the CO, the methane emissions, then the temperature will get colder because the lifetime of CH of methane in the atmosphere is very short, 10, 15 years. With the CO2 at the beginning, the temperature will still go up until a time where it doesn't go up any longer. But what is the conclusion, a practical conclusion of this? Is that a very good bet, a very good practical recommendation is try very hard to reduce methane. Because if we reduce methane, we will have an immediate impact on temperature. Now, when you say that, immediately nations like Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, uh, countries that depend a lot on the livestock production become very nervous because that they mean that means for them, oh, I have to get rid of all my cows because those are the problem. That's a problem in the methane emissions in the world. Well, let's review that. Let's go back to the sources of emissions of greenhouse gases. And now let's go to some details. And of course, don't pay attention to all of this. Pay attention to this here. In the energy sector, we, we see fugitive emissions from the fossil fuels that amount about 6% of the methane emissions in the world, which are basically the same as the total sum of emissions from the livestock and manure management in the world. Where are these fugitive emissions coming from? 
they come from venting coal mines. Every time you open a new coal mine, there's a lot of methane in the in the in that space, and you have to vent. You have to take all the methane from the mines to ensure security of the person that is going to be working in the mines. That's a lot of methane going released to the atmosphere. Every time you start, you have a new oil well. There's a lot of methane losses. Every time you find a new natural gas deposit, you have a lot of fugitive losses. There's a lot of losses in transportation of natural gas trans uh, pipelines. And there's a lot of losses in fracking. In addition to the terrible promise of fracking to water quality, there is also a lot of losses there. So what happens is that the scientific community said, this is a very good idea. Let's try hard to reduce the, pipe, the methane losses. And the best, the most immediate opportunity is reduce losses from the fossil fuels. Why? Because a lot of these losses have negative cost. The companies that are losing all this methane, if they are able to capture the methane and sell it as natural gas, they is cost negative. And then there's a lot of other uh, measures that they can take with a very reasonable cost. So just need the right, uh, the right stimulation to, to change those practices. So there are scientific papers that started looking at what are the concrete actions that can happen to reduce these methane emissions. And by country. And, and you can see here the, the difference. Here is what, look at here, is how much, or here, how much temperature you can reduce, how, how, how much you can cool down the temperature by doing these interventions, by reducing methane gases, me methane emissions from oil and gas, from natural gas, from coal mines. And look at the difference in the opportunities that we have in the different countries of the world. Look at the impact of working in the coal sector of China. So the important thing here is that there are very practical recommendations, very doable interventions that will result in reductions of net emissions of methane that include fossil fuels and some reduction in, in livestock production, which is very doable too, and better management of waste, of residues. And if, if we are able to do that as a society, if we combine measurements of methane reductions and CO2 reductions, remember that the key here is to reduce CO2 re reductions. So if we are able to decarbonize our energy sources, we can still be optimistic. By the end of the year, we will be in the target of around one and a half degree. So I hope I didn't, but I didn't bore you too much with all this science, but I, the main message is two. One, the best way to improve adaptation to possible climate change in the future is concentrating what can we do today to improve the adaptive capacities of societies. That's the best way to, to, to improve adaptation. And two, the main problem here is emission of greenhouse gases. We have to decarbonize our energy. We have to go rapidly into renewable sources. But immediately, if we can reduce the net emissions of methane, we'll have a direct and rapid impact on temperature, global temperatures. Thank you. And of course, I'm ready, I'll be available for any questions or comments. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Walter. Thank you. No, you scared us. I don't, you didn't, uh, it, maybe we didn't follow all the details, but the main impression is we're scared. Uh, uh, by the way, the questions should be directed to the chat function. I mentioned the Q&A function, but it's the chat function. Please put them in there. Walter will come back to them at the end. Walter, just let me get a quick final question, if you could. What are we, what are the range, if you look at those different scenarios for gas emissions, what kind of a temperature ranges are we looking at uh, by, the, by the end of the century? Best case, worst case? Well, worst, 
I'm going to answer the question. Uh, worst case is about four degrees C, Celsius or more. Best possible scenario is 1.5. But the, the, the reality is that if you think, Tom, if you think about those numbers, they don't say much. If you, you, you live in Rio, right? I mean, one day you have 30 degrees. The next day you may have 24 degrees. Because you have yeah. a cold front. So for the people thinking of a change in four degrees is nothing. But you have to think that this is global temperature. This is something that has been in equilibrium for hundreds of thousands of years. And modifying that equilibrium in half a degree has a huge impact on the hydrological cycle, global water cycle, and affects this uh, climate variability a lot. So the, even, even when uh, the numbers don't sound like a lot, we have to think of two things. One is even small changes at global level may have big impacts at local level, mainly because of this variability. And two, the way, the only way to reduce, to get to these optimistic scenarios is to be very, very, uh, careful in reducing, in decarbonizing the energy of the planet. That's, that's it. Very, very good. A lot of more questions that that leads to, Walter. But we've heard, so to speak, I said it's a little bit of a, a rehearsal for COP26. The scientists will speak clearly, but then it's all up to the policymakers, isn't it, John and, uh, and, and Melanie, uh, and how they'll react and how that gets translated uh, into whose coal mine gets shut down and, and which country has to commit to methane uh, reductions and, and so forth. So John, uh, we can turn to you, John, on really what, uh, what uh, we should expect. Uh, uh, first you, and then uh, I think in, in tandem following your remarks, Melody, to pick up on those same, same themes. And again, what, what would make, what would make uh, uh, Glasgow a success and God forbid, what would make it a failure? Thank you, John, for being with us this morning. The floor is yours. Sure. Thank you, Tom, and thanks everybody for joining us. This is an exciting opportunity for us. Um, so I'm gonna take off where Walter, I'm gonna start where Walter left off. And the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that Walter talked about was a scientific effort to understand what's going on. Does it matter if you put a whole lot more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and what kind of impact will it have on us? The political response to that has been the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which as Tom said, grew out of the, the three Rio conventions that came out of the, uh, the, 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 Rio, um, the Rio conventions in 1992. The other two are the Convention on Biodiversity and the Convention on Combating Desertification. And then of course, the UNFCCC is the Framework Convention on Climate Change. Now way back, uh, in the mid 90s when the convention or early 90s when the convention was signed, the goal of the convention was to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic or human induced interference in the climate system. And that level should be such that it, uh, it's achieved quickly enough to allow ecosystems to adapt naturally and to ensure that food production Art is not threatened and enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner. But there's vagueness about what is that level of greenhouse gas emissions. And the intention way back then was that we would get something in place very quickly. They, they committed to, these, to this goal, uh, but the, the convention itself um, laid out goals or kind of a framework, rules of the road, but it didn't lay out the specifics of how to achieve things. Uh, that was expected to be negotiated um, year by year. And Tom mentioned some of the big, uh, the big meetings that have happened in the past, Kyoto, which was in 1997, where we thought that we had agreed on a way that we would really limit those emissions. Uh, so 15, almost 20 years ago. And then that didn't work out. The US didn't join and a lot of the targets that were set were never met. Um, so then Copenhagen was the, the next big opportunity, the next big hope. And that one kind of came apart at the end as well. 
Um, and meanwhile, all along, emissions were, were growing uh, throughout the last 20 odd years, 25 years, 26 years. Um, and so Paris was the, the next big hope. And one thing I wanna say is that one of the things that has limited the ability to get an agreement is that this is not a majority process. It's a consensus process. Every country gets one vote. It doesn't matter if you're a huge country like the US or China or a small country like the Maldives or Burkina Faso, everybody gets a vote. And so that gives every, each country an ability to really hold out for what they need in the agreement. And Melody's gonna talk about this a little bit more. Um, but that was part of when, what went off the rails in, Co in Copenhagen, um, was a few countries objected to some of the key elements of Copenhagen and they used that, that clout that they had to, uh, to, to stop the process. Um, so Paris was an agreement um, that really laid out the rules of what the world would agree to, to try to reduce emissions. Paris committed, the countries committed um, to take steps to reduce emissions consistent with limiting warming to, it said, well below two degrees and really aim for 1.5 degrees. And it was meant to be done, not in a jarring way that would, uh, would, would cause abrupt economic disruptions, but each country came up with what's called a, a nationally determined contribution. Every country said, here's what we can do in the first five years, and we're gonna do it. And then every five years, they, they come up with new commitments to reduce emissions. Um, and so the countries have made their, their commitments, and um, what's important about Glasgow is this is where we both assess how things are going um, because all the countries are in. And when countries have been making their new commitments for the next five year period. So the key in Glasgow is we get to see how well the roadmap laid out in Paris is working. And we get to see uh, what countries are committing to do in the next five years. And the idea, again, was that step by step in five year increments, we would reduce emissions of all greenhouse gases um, year by year to keep by the end of the century, we would limit warming to two, two degrees or ideally one and a half degrees. And the hope was that after one or two of these five year stair steps, we tip across some technological and economic thresholds and the, the the drop in emissions would become very rapid. So what's key in Glasgow is that the new, the new, uh, the new commitments are coming in. Um, what was committed in Paris looked like if everybody did what they committed to in Paris, they would limit warming by about 3% between 2015 and last year. And last year is now kind of this year because of COVID. Um, this is the COP that should have happened last year. So it's, it's kind of like the Olympics. The Olympics were the 2020 Olympics, even though they happened in 2021. And this is COP26, even though it's, it's the year for COP27. Um, and then a quick analysis of what's happened, what's been submitted for the next year, five-year period, Um, another about 3% uh, drop. Uh, several key countries have either not submitted their new commitments or um, they've raised their, their, the emissions that they've said they will, they will uh, emit over the next five years. Um, so that's discouraging. And that's what the, the civil society, the NGOs, the academics and the public are gonna be looking for in Paris, and more importantly, uh, Melody's gonna talk a bit about um, climate justice, but this is a case where about 20 countries are responsible for, the, for 75 or 80% of emissions, but there's almost 200 countries that have signed on. And so those, the lower 180 countries or so in terms of emissions don't have much they can do to solve the problem and their economies and their societies and their people are at risk. And so 
uh, there's a lot of frustration from the developing countries over what are the, the big countries doing to reduce emissions because of the developing countries' dependence on agriculture and tourism and their physical vulnerability to some of the threats. Um, Tom also asked me to speak a little bit about US leadership. Um, I think US leadership is critical for several, several reasons. And as Tom said, I was a part of the, the US delegation for about 10 years when I was with USAID. So I'm gonna be a little bit biased, but um, I think when the US is an active participant, the US can truly lead. And when the US is recalcitrant, um, it kind of feels like an anchor on the whole uh, on the whole process. It's hard given that the US is the biggest emitter historically. Um, most of the CO2 in the atmosphere that Walter was talking about um, comes, from, comes from the US or have come from the US uh, or we have the biggest share anyway. Um, and we're the second biggest emitter going forward or today. Um, so we need to take the lead given that we're a major emitter. We have the world's biggest economy. And so the world thinks that we need to take the lead uh, and show that you can grow an economy while also cleaning up economic activity. Um, and that if the US leads, others will follow. Um, the world also expects that given the innovation in, our, in the US economy, um, that we will lead the way in finding technological solutions. And then given our role as a superpower, the world simply expects the US to take the lead on all sorts of issues, including this one. So there's been uh, a lot in the news lately about whether or not President Biden will be able to deliver. Um, the, 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 the new plan uh, dropped last night or this morning. Um, I took a quick look at what was reported in the New York Times and it looks promising, not as promising as the original, uh, what was originally proposed, um, but there are incentives in there for the public to buy electric cars, which will cut a lot of the transportation emissions. Um, there will be investment in charging stations so that the public can charge up when they're driving around. And then there are incentives uh, and tax credits for clean energy producers um, to get a break on what they're doing. The key will be getting that adopted and then seeing some continuity. One of the goals around Paris was there were several important things in Paris. One was it was meant to send a consistent market signal that the whole world was committing to doing this. And so that if you invested in clean energy, you invested in getting out of fossil fuel energy, the world's economies would stand by you and it would be a reliable investment. There wouldn't be this, like we see in the US where there's uh, a vote for uh, renewable tax credits that then gets threatened a few years later. Um, so we wanted to provide a stable investment environment for the private sector. And we wanted to provide, um, there's a transparency regime that's supposed to be there. So that one of the ideas in, the, in that stair step process was that each country would be able to see what the others are, do and are doing. And there was a hope that there would be a, a virtuous cycle of if the US commits to reducing emissions, China and the EU would try to keep up. If they took the lead, then we would try to catch up. Um, and Russia and Brazil and South Africa and Australia and so on. So a lot of the debate over the last few years is how does that transparency regime work? Some countries don't want more transparencies, others do. Um, so back to Biden and his ability to deliver. His negotiating team is very experienced. As Tom said, John Kerry led the, the delegation in Paris and helped get that deal. Others have been around since before Kyoto. Some have been around since Rio. And so they've seen what happens when the US plays a role in shaping things and what happens to sort of the mood, the spirit and the realization of the agreement if the US withdraws as we did with Kyoto and as, as President Trump did, former President Trump did um, with Paris. And they certainly felt the frustration in Copenhagen when it looked like we were gonna get a deal and then it, it didn't work out at the last minute. Um, this is the first COP since the US withdrew and then came back in. So expectations will be very high for what, uh, what 
the US team can deliver. Um, and I expect that they will have been talking a lot about what's happened in, in recent years, um, going back to Kyoto and trying to figure ways to offer things that can be delivered uh, with either a supportive Congress or a recalcitrant Congress. And I think with that, I will stop and hand it over to Tom, either Tom or Melody. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Johnny. We'll go take a breath here and then hand it over to, uh, to Melody to pick up from that point. Thank you very, very much. Just a quick question, although it's a complicated issue, I know. US-China, uh, collaborate or, uh, or uh, conspire against uh, as we, uh, in this round of agreements, uh, um, how do you look upon that, uh, that, that rivalry playing out in Glasgow? I'm not sure. President Xi has said he was not going to go. Um, China, is, China, like Europe, are very worried about um, their energy needs over the, the coming winter. Uh, I think Europe, as much for heating as for uh, powering things. China, for uh, keeping its manufacturing going. Um, China has committed to no longer investing in overseas coal. Uh, coal-fired power plants, so that's a good sign. Um, they are ramping up their coal mining, as I understand it, right now because they they need energy to as they come out of the pandemic. So this is the tension um, for all countries, but particularly you know the U.S., China, EU, some of the other bigger economies that that have a major impact on the climate. Is how do they grow the economy and keep their people happy with a growing economy while also cutting emissions. And so that transparency regime in Paris was meant to impose a bit of shame and positive competition. And we'll see how that plays out. Um, I hope that a lot of some of the, the rhetoric that we've heard coming out from China and about China will be uh, more about sort of prodding a new U.S. administration see how they respond and not about uh, actually pulling back from their commitments. Very, very good. Thank, uh, thank you uh, very much, John, so much uh, uh, there. Uh, for those of us following the, maybe the more closely the COP26 than we did previous ones and talking about Paris, I, I think what I hear you saying is even if countries adhere to their stated pledges made, uh, the NDAs, you call them, or NDCs, excuse me, even if they are doing that, which they're not, that isn't enough. So there, we have to go even deeper than that. So maybe some of the issues for, when we come to the Q&A and the chat, in the chat function will be whether Glasgow will help on enforcement mechanisms, uh, how we can exert more than just moral pressure on countries to, uh, uh, to enforce uh, uh, new and, and, and tightened uh, uh, pledges. But thank you so much, John. Uh, Melody, it's up to you now to uh, get, kind of Compliment what John has said. Your expectations, and uh, if you if you care to do so, um, uh, focus a little bit more on the perspective of those 180 country, countries that uh, John mentioned, who are in a sense innocent bystanders uh, to all of this uh, impending climate damage. And to all of you online, remember to look at the chat function. I remind the speakers we'll probably go pretty quickly to the chats, but there's lots of questions coming in there, and I'll need the speakers' help to kind of curate them and, and focus on the most relevant ones. Uh, that they care that respond to. But Melody, over to you now for your initial comments. Welcome. Thank you, Tom. And I'm glad we were just talking about the US and China just now because it's a perfect transition. So yeah, a question that we get a lot when we come back from COP is like, how does the system allow for every country in the world to have a voice? You know, do, when you have every single country represented, how does it how does a country like, I don't know, Bangladesh or Tuvalu or, or smaller economies um, make their voice heard um, in front of other countries like the US or China? So I would say that obviously, as, as John you know, was, was saying, big economies, big powerful economies are definitely dominating the negotiations in a way. Um, I mean, for example, the Kyoto Protocol uh, failed for a number of reasons, but partially because at some point it ended up just covering about half of the global emissions after some of the big players decided not to be part of it. And so obviously we're looking at the biggest emitters and, and uh, if they don't want to be part of it, that has an impact on the rest of the negotiations. Um, there's also very much a question of 
inclusion and fairness in the process. Um, developing country delegations often have uh, much less resources, much smaller delegations, and very concretely, when you go to COP, that means that when there are you know, 70 plus agenda items to follow uh, at some COPs uh, and multiple parallel meetings and sessions that are happening at every hour of the day, you can't possibly follow everything or be everywhere. So the US, you know, make sure to have someone in every room, but some delegations from some other countries have 10 people total. So they have to make choices about what they follow. That also means that when, when the meetings go, you know, up until the middle of the night, which is quite common at COP, you can't take shifts within your delegation. So you have delegates that are sometimes, you know, half asleep in the middle of the night because they're trying to, they've been there from seven in the morning and they're trying to follow everything. Uh, when the COP goes over time, when they go beyond the two weeks, which also is quite common, um, some delegation can't necessarily pay for, you know, new flights and extra accommodation. And, and those things that can sound like logistical issues um, in the end have an impact on how much these delegations are able to, to have a voice and to be part of important discussions. But that being said, um, there are different ways in which less powerful countries can have their voice heard. So first of all, um, they go into alliances of like-minded states. So countries don't usually negotiate alone. Um, there are alliances like, for example, the Least Developed Countries Alliance, uh, LDC, the Africa Group, there's a small island developing states, the SIDS, they all have acronyms, uh, which can be confusing if you're not familiar with the COP jargon. So they, they join in these like-minded um, groups and then they negotiate together as a bloc. And that allows to put more pressure on, on, on well, it's more pressure than individual countries, right? And then in addition to that, and that's maybe one of the most important things, is that the, the COP decisions require a consensus. And so consensus is the absence of a no, which means that um, not everyone has to say yes, but if somebody says no, uh, there is no consensus. And so there can be, the text cannot be adopted. And in a way, um, you know, that's why it was so hard to get to the Paris Agreement. A lot of people are saying the Paris Agreement was really disappointing. Um, because it doesn't go far enough, because it's not legally binding. But at the same time, if you had one single country, if one single country had said no, we wouldn't have a Paris Agreement. So it makes it very difficult to, um, to, to move things forward. Um, we, John and I, um, we organized a, a class, we, we gave a class on the climate negotiations at Columbia um, in the fall, and we had a guest, we had invited uh, the former environment minister of Panama as a guest, and he was talking about one of the cups where he went as, a, as the environment minister of Panama, and he was told, um, you have one focus at this cup, there are like these specific items that we want to be included on forestry, and your job is really to make sure that these items are in there and don't don't worry about the rest. This is your goal. And basically, even a small country like Panama has the power to say, if these things are not in the text, I will not I will not agree. I will not sign on. So there is a there is a certain power there. Um, another example, I remember, I think it must have been in 2010 or 2011, there were these intercessions of negotiations in Bonn in June, and those usually last for two weeks. And this was my first time going to the intercessions, and nothing happened for the entire first week because one country had refused to agree on the agenda. And so that's a power move, right? So it's even if you're a small country, you can block things. Um, so finally, one more thing that that is particularly important this year, actually, is that um, when it comes to some agenda items, you can be backed by civil society. And it's very much the case this year on, on a number of things that touch um, that, that are about climate justice. There's a very, very strong set of demands from civil society that are really aligned with the demands from um, the, the least developed countries. And so that just is another way to increase the, the pressure. Um, and yeah, so like I was saying, one, one very big issue this year in Glasgow and that, that I think will, will really determine if um, a big part of the world considers Glasgow a success or not is how climate justice is going to be addressed. Um, you know, there are many ways in which the, the, the process and the response to the climate crisis are deeply unfair and unequal, as, as you know. Um, 
you know, as a, as a starter, I've mentioned how the negotiation process itself is not necessarily fair, even during a normal COP, because not every not every delegation has the same resources. But this year, on top of that, you have the, the COVID-19 um, context, you have the vaccine inequity, um, there's a need for quarantine when you do to even just be able to, to attend COP, depending on where you come from. And that ends up affecting developing countries more than others. And so that, again, implies having additional resources. So it just feels like it's always the same people that are that have to jump through extra hoops to be able to be heard. And those people happen to be the ones that are impacted the most by, by the problem. So there's really a question about power and resources and, and solidarity as well. And then, I mean, of course, like John was, was explaining earlier, you know, there is a recognition that a very small portion of countries are uh, responsible for the emission, the, the biggest part of the emissions. Um, and from the very beginning of this negotiation process from, from 1992 in Rio, from the convention, uh, there was an agreement that the countries that have polluted the most, the developed countries that have built their economies on these emissions, have a bigger responsibility to, uh, to respond to the crisis. So there was an agreement on that from the very beginning. Uh, there's something called the, the, the CBDR in jargon, the common but differentiated responsibility, which is really the fact that developed countries have a bigger responsibility. This, this was an agreement, but still, even, even if that was agreed upon from the start, the level of ambition is too low. Uh, the finance commitments that have been made still haven't been met. You know, 12 years after Copenhagen, six, six years after Paris, we're still, we still don't have the money. We still don't see the money that was promised. So basically, developing countries are losing their patience. And, and so is civil society, I think, um, you know, to a certain extent, because the situation is, is critical. Uh, Climate impacts are visible everywhere. We're talking about, you know, reaching 1.5 degree, trying to stay under 1.5, but we're almost at, at 1.1 above pre-industrial level. And we've seen impacts all around the world, not just in developing countries, but even, you know, the heat dome in the US or the floods in Germany, or we're seeing that everywhere now. Uh, the IPCC report has just been confirming that. And, and so we are seeing that everywhere. We know that we need to act, but, not everyone is affecting, affected the same. Uh, so the projected costs of, um, of impact, climate impacts and loss and damage in, in developing countries is estimated to be around 300 to $600 billion a year by 2030. And um, they're only asking for 100, 100 billion a year um, to address the, the, the loss, the, the, basically to be able to adapt and to mitigate climate impacts. Uh, and we're not even able to, to reach that. And the cost of the impacts are going to be way, way higher than that. So there is this frustration. Uh, and that is very much a climate justice issue. Um, as you said, the, the ambition is too low. The, the, the ambition should be doubled at least, if not quadrupled, if we want to have a chance to stay under 1.5. So basically, with that in mind, with that context and that like pressure that's, that's growing, um, what, what the developing countries are asking and what a large number of organizations from, from civil society and the youth are, are demanding is obviously one to raise ambition. And that means, uh, yes, reducing emissions, but that means actually uh, you know, promising a real cut in emissions, having a real path showing how that's gonna happen. Uh, that means you know, no, no offsetting as a way to avoid to reduce emissions. That means no empty net zero promises when at the same time you approve you know, pipelines or you build new coal power plants or you invest so much public money in fossil fuel subsidies. There's really a demand to say we need actual emission reductions and that's non-negotiable for, for you know, a lot of the, well, for the, for the developing countries and a big part of the civil society. And then we need to raise finance. Um, so we've said that you know developed countries had promised 100 billion a year to developing countries to address climate impacts, to do clean, cleaner development, and 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 uh, cover the the cost of adaptation. That's never been achieved, not a single time since it's been promised. So that needs to happen. And um, with COVID, it's obviously going to be going to be harder. Uh, to get there, but it's also more than ever needed for developing countries because they've had to um, to spend even more on the COVID recovery. Um, there are more and more people that are yeah 
that are uh, affected by climate impacts, but at the same time, the country has had to deal with this massive pandemic. So what they need now and what they're, what they're asking for is not just promises every year that maybe will reach those 100, those 100 billion, but they would like to see a longer, like a, a roadmap, maybe over five years of how, what this funding is going to look like so that they can plan accordingly. Um, and they keep highlighting that this has to happen because this is very small compared to the trillions of dollars that are needed to actually um, stay under 1.5. The other thing about this, this uh, finance point is that most of what's been provided so far has gone into mitigation. And there's a need to put more of that money into adaptation because like, you know, as we said, uh, climate change is happening now and those countries are already having to pay the bill. Um, but then one additional thing about finance is that um, it's not an official agenda item this year, but what's really been pushed to the center of the discussion is finding a mechanism about uh, loss and damage finance. So loss and damage is basically everything that will be lost or damaged be, even if we mitigate and even if we adapt. And that's something that's been included in the Paris Agreement. It's been recognized, but there's no, no mechanism um, to address the costs of loss and damage. So there is a, a demand from the least developed countries and from civil society to really put that at the center of the discussions this year. And they're saying, if this is not the case, we will not consider um, COP26 uh, a success. So what does that mean is that there, there's, there needs to be a plan, um, there needs to be a discussion on how we're going to make finance for loss and damage available relatively quickly in addition to the 100 billion a year that are due for adaptation and mitigation. And we need that plan to take place now, like right after COP26, but also in the long term, beyond 2025. And it needs to be increasing progressively. And what they're saying is we want to apply the principle of the polluter payer. So the countries that have been emitting more, they have to contribute to that. But also the private sector, like the fossil fuel companies, they have to, to participate in that. And there are many mechanisms that exist in other sectors that have been used before. Uh, that could be used as examples uh, for this. So there needs to be a process to identify the scale of the funding that's needed. There needs to be a mechanism to deliver that funding. Um, there are a number of discussions about, you know, what, what are the mechanisms for that? Insurance is part of that. Uh, climate risk insurance has been a bit of a contentious topic in the negotiations in the past few years. We have a team at IRI working on that. Um, so we're always participating in those discussions as well. And so there needs to be operational support uh, to developing countries to distribute that loss and damage funding and make sure that it reaches the most vulnerable. There's really a, a, a request on each of the, the agenda items to make sure that it reaches the most vulnerable, that it is inclusive, that uh, people have access, people can uh, engage in those discussions and, and, and have access to the decision-making processes. Um, one, one other thing that I wanted to, to add is, is maybe something that we hear a little bit less often in the, in the media is the importance of the youth. And the youth have always played a role in the negotiations. Um, they have a youth constituency that's recognized officially by the UN. They, they're given a voice, uh, you know, they can make interventions in some of the, in some of the plenaries. But um, I think we've never seen as much engagement of the youth as we have in the past few years. You know, they, they've taken the streets and, and not just that, but they're really doing their homeworks. They're really analyzing all the policies. They're creating collectives and networks and, and alliances, and, and they're making very concrete um, suggestions on, on how, or demands on, on how things need to change. So one thing, for example, that the youth are really pushing <clears throat> is called uh, Action for Climate Empowerment, ACE. Um, it's, it's in the Paris Agreement, Article 12. And basically, it's again very related to climate justice because it consists in um, enabling everyone in society to engage in climate action. And that requires education and capacity building, but that also really requires a seat at the table for marginalized groups at different levels of that decision-making process. And so an example of some of the things that they're asking is they want, you know, at, at COP level, they would like to see youth delegates in every, in every delegation of every country. They would like to have a UN body that's really enhancing youth participation. They would like to uh, be able to participate in mechanisms to monitor 
climate plans and policies because those are voluntary, but they work on peer pressure. So the youth want to be able to, to monitor that and to provide feedback. They also want more inclusion at national level. They want, you know, more funded and inclusive capacity building programs and education. Um, and, and they're just, they're also asking for broader things like different metrics that are not GDP, for example, you know, um, that are really helping us with that just transition that is needed. So it's, uh, it's really inspiring to see, to see them really start playing this, uh, this bigger role um, in the negotiations. And, and that's actually going to be, I think, a massive plus, like a, a massive support to the points that the, that the least developed countries are making. And, and, and I, I really want to emphasize that because it's something that we get asked a lot. You know, we talk to, um, to young people uh, in different contexts and the question is always, what can I do? And, um, and that's really to me a sign that as, as a young person, that's just part of civil society. There's so many ways you can, you can get involved. I'm going to stop there, but thanks. You're muted. you're muted, Tom. Tom, you're muted. Sometimes that's an advantage in these event webinars that I'm muted, but I think we've had some wonderful uh, presentation going a little beyond what I hope would be the start of our Q&A. So I'm gonna go to that pretty quickly right now. Just, I just wanted maybe if I could uh, raise some questions that you wanna consider about. We'll, we'll turn first to you, Walter, because a lot of the questions I don't even understand them fully. So I'm gonna ask you to filter through the more technical scientific questions. And, and I'll turn to you in just a moment, Walter, to answer some of those that are coming in via the chat. For you, John, and, and for you, Melody, um, just a the, the, the quick question uh, for you might be uh, rays of hope. Uh, you know, it's such a dire situation. Code Red for Humanity, our last best chance. I mean, this is it. This is not a drill. This is the real thing. Uh, but where are the rays of hope in all of this? Uh, Technology-wise, um, Adaptation-wise, uh, Melody and or John, and if you want, either one of you want to take that on. For example, whoever thought we'd have so many electric cars in the United States uh, that we have already, and that we'll have by 2030, many more. I mean, that's an example. And 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 our, what are the success stories in terms of adaptation, uh, Melanie? And on the country, who's which those developing countries are you most worried about? You've talked in general. Maybe you could put some names. And, and, and places to, uh, to, for us to consider. So just quickly, those two issues to throw it back at John and Melody and then at John, and then Walter will turn it over to you to handle some of the, the, the many scientific uh, uh, observations that come in on the chat function. Melody, you can, you, can I ask you to speak first? Sure, yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a great question. I actually love that question about optimism and you know, how do we stay hopeful? Um, there's one example that I, that I give all the time as, a, as an example of, of hope. So my first COP was Copenhagen and Copenhagen was supposed to be the summit that was going to change the world. And I was a student and I was going there to film, interview people about expectations of civil society. And I was full of hope when I went there and it was uh, quite a massive failure. And after Copenhagen, um, Christiana Figueres took on the job of uh, executive secretary of the UNFCCC. So in short, she was a new person in charge of uh, coordinating this negotiation process after this big failure in Copenhagen, and in her first um, in her first interview on the job, she was asked, "Are we ever going to see a global climate agreement?" And her response was, "Not in my lifetime." Mm -hmm. And six years later, we had the Paris Agreement. She led the the world um, to the Paris Agreement. So. That to, to me is already just a sign that, you know, you may think at one point that nothing is possible, but we have been there and we have seen progress. Now, is it, is it enough? Of course not. We, we are seeing a lot of things. I think the beauty of working in adaptation is, yeah, it can be depressing if you look at numbers, but also we get to work in, in, in places where there's just so many innovations all the time. I, I lived in Bangladesh. I've been working in Bangladesh for about 10 years now. It's a country that's very dear to my heart and it's partly because Yes, they are among the, the most affected, you know, in the world and, and billions, tens of billions of tens of millions of people might have to move with sea level rise. And it's the most densely populated country. So uh, there is no space for this 20 to 30 million people that might have to move uh, by the end of the century if, if we look at some of the projections. But there's so much that is happening. They're doing so much 
in terms of adaptation at local level, they're doing so much to push the policies to adapt. Um, it can be things like actual concrete um, you know, adaptation in agriculture and aquaculture, but it's also things like, well, we need to prepare smaller cities to, to be ready for uh, migration that might come in and you know, make sure that the cities are able to uh, take on this, this, these newcomers as part of the workforce and as a, as a benefit and not as, a, as just additional uh, burden. And, and in the policies, they've been pushing very hard on things like loss and damage and adaptation. And so I, I think it's very inspiring to see what's going on um, all around the world. We have all the, the solutions. We have the technology. We're seeing the private sector really, um, you know, they, they're, they're really stepping up. But I think what's what it boils down to is we have a system in place, like a, the, the Paris Agreement basically allows us to make this happen. We have the technologies, but the only thing that we need is ambition from the governments. And that is something that is very dependent on the voters. And, and you know, similarly, the private sector is playing a bigger role. And that is something that is also very dependent on our choices as in, individuals as well. Um, so so I think there are it boils down to that and there are many, many ways we can have an influence on that. And that makes me hopeful. I mean, we've seen it with every, every other major social change in the history of humanity. So uh, yeah, I, I, wanna, I wanna believe that we can tackle that. So we're not all gonna be like the dinosaurs here and meet, that, meet their fate, uh, hopefully. John, did you wanna weigh in on this issue of race of hope? What makes you optimistic going to Glasgow rather than worry, if yeah, anything? I think, I think Melody put it nicely, but um, I'll say that in either 1996 or 1997, the US Senate passed a bill called the Bird Hagel Act that said that the US would not enter any climate agreement that undermined our economy unless our competition, namely China and India, also signed on. Today, I don't think that would pass. Um, Joe Biden was one of the signatories to that. Yeah. So even though it seems like the US Congress is still recalcitrant, we've moved a very long way from where we were 20 years ago. It's a real shame we didn't take action then because it'd be a whole lot easier now. Um, another thing that is encouraging at the local level or at the national level is all the, the things that Melody has talked about. Um, countries, you know, the IRI works a lot with agriculture and countries are showing that at the farm level, farmers, smallholder farmers can take information about what's gonna happen in the next season, which is when the time scale that they'll be affected in and make different decisions that build their resilience and reduce the risk of, of uh, economic or crop losses. That's very positive. And one of the things that um, in that course that Melody and I taught that she mentioned, um, we had somebody from the framework convention from the secretariat speaking. And he said, look, when things don't go right, it's not the convention's fault. It's, it's usually not what we agree at these big meetings. It's what countries do when they go home. It's what happens between the big agreements. So uh, there's a number of questions that I'll come back to later about enforcement in the, in the chat, but it's really a question of will. And I think the amount of attention that this COP is getting uh, hopefully is encouraging at moving, as Melody said, moving the voters, moving the politicians, let everybody see that the world really cares about this. Um, and then the unpleasant evidence of fires and floods and droughts and so forth, hopefully will remain in people's minds uh, and keep them thinking about it as we go into the next, you know, as we go away from Glasgow and go home and have to act on what's, what's been agreed and what gets agreed there. Thank you very much, John. Well said. Um, let, Walter, let's, let's turn to you then, Walter, go back to you on the science and maybe ask you to wade through, if you could, or curate and answer as you feel appropriate some of the questions that have come to you on methane gas and, and other more, more scientific and technological parts. Walter, well, could you sure. take a few minutes? Yeah, so if you, if you allow me, Tom, let, let, me, let me start before uh, following what Melody and John said. I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm optimistic. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason why I'm, I'm optimistic is because several things changed in the last years. One thing is the pandemic. The pandemic is the first time in a hundred years that people in the world 
realize what a global problem can do. That's one thing. The other thing is young people. Young people are not only, you know, fighting like Melody was describing, but also they are creating a new culture of consumption. You know, it, it's very, one of the comments in the chat was saying this, it's very, very clear that now companies are realizing that even if they're extremely selfish and just looking at the bottom line, they, they are realizing that they have to do a better job in the environmental impacts of their products, in the social impacts of the products. They have to measure all these ESG indicators or they lose consumers. So there is a very strong economic incentive to do things better. Maybe not for the right reasons, but they have very good incentives. <laughs> uh, and three, regarding mitigation, reduction of emissions, I, I would say this. Uh, it, it's critically important that the wealthier countries support activities to improve adaptation in the developing world. But the truth is that if we don't reduce emissions, we will not be able to adapt. And, and the good news is that I think mainly, or probably in, to a great extent, because of that unbalanced amount of funds that went into mitigation for the last few decades, today, Generating a megawatt with a solar panel is cheaper than generating a megawatt with fossil fuels. And so again, maybe not because of the right reasons, morally right reasons, but there are very good incentives to change the energy matrix. Yesterday, I went to a meeting in Uruguay. Uruguay is a very small country. 100% of the electricity in that country is renewable. 50% mm. of the total energy in that country is renewable. And they're doing well. They're doing very well. So, the, you know, what, what this, this pressure, this, these are all economic pressures. And I wish we were in a world where moral principles were the things that were driving change. But reality is that economics drive change. There's a lot of factors, changes in consumer behavior, uh, prices of generating energy with renewable sources. Th those are all forces that are going in the right direction. And so I am optimistic. I I'm not extremely optimistic, but I am optimistic. I think that there's a lot of things that are aligning now to, to change the energy matrix, which is, again, the critical thing. 70% of the emissions come from there. We have to decarbonize that. And the good news is that it's becoming good business to do it. And it's creating new jobs, new job opportunities in the renewable energy sector. So that, that's a very general comment. And there are very, very short comments on the more technical issues. Why does rice uh, contribute to method? This is very important. You know, a lot of people in the world uh, produce rice. One, rice is responsible for about 1% of the total emissions. So let's put that in perspective. Two, why is rice producing methane? Because rice is flooded. To, to produce rice, you flood the field, which means that in the soil, you displace the air that was in the soil with the oxygen. And now you have microorganisms that can respire without oxygen. Those microorganisms, when they respire, they produce methane. Now, what is the solution to reduce methane from rice? Intermittent flooding. Instead of having the, the, the rice field permanently flooded, you have it intermittently flooded. Sometimes you, you, use, you use the water, you flood the, fire, the field, then you, with drainage, you take the water, then you add water again, and just by moving those, by changing those conditions in the soil, you reduce a lot the emissions of methane. Two, why a very small change in global temperature 
can have such a big effect on local climate. We, we have to imagine the world as a closed system where you have big oceans that are evaporating water, that water goes up, it goes to colder areas, it becomes from vapor, it becomes liquid water, it rains some, somewhere, then the plants absorb that water, transpire that water, or go back to the oceans, and then you have this cycle of water. Now imagine this is a closed system where you have evaporation, rainfall, drainage of transpiration, go back to the ocean and so on. You have a very, a closed system in, a, in an equilibrium situation and then you add heat to that. Now that cycle becomes more intense. Now you have more evaporation here, now you have more rainfall here, you have no rainfall in this other place. This is what, what really matters is you become, you in, in a system that was in a very nice equilibrium, you add heat and the whole thing becomes more intense. And that effect, that is flooding in some places, drought in other places. So this is why small changes in the global temperature can affect so much a farmer in Bangladesh. Thank you, Walter. Thank you for that. <laughs> That mini uh, class, I almost feel like I understand the, uh, the, the science so much better. John, John, maybe over to you, uh, any comments that you'd like to respond to that you see coming from the students and the other observers in the, in the chat room? Uh, let me turn it over to you for your assessment. Sure, so the, I just, I forgot to mention it when I was talking, but the issue of the $100 billion uh, is sort of a microcosm of the original vagueness in the original um, convention. The hundred billion dollars was one of the few things that was able to be agreed to in Copenhagen. Um, and, but it, it said a hundred billion dollars from a wide variety of sources, including public and private. And when we were having that, when Melody and I were teaching that course, um, the guy who was the former minister of environment from Panama is, is an old friend of mine. And I said, you know, that the US delegation interpreted that as very much including private investment. And we immediately did a calculation and found that there were two or $300 billion a year in private investment in renewable energy globally. Emilio said, no, that wasn't private. That was meant to be public. And so it was vague and there, so there's this disagreement now and the understanding is that both are necessary. And to me, what would be ideal or closer to ideal would be the private money would, would go toward mitigation of the problem and the public money would go to support adaptation. So you'd actually have uh, closer to the full hundred billion going for adaptation because that's harder to make the business case for. I mean, in, the, in, in theory you can, but it's harder to account for it on a, on a spreadsheet or something because you're avoiding damages rather than uh, cutting costs in the near term. And then let the, the private investment where you can measure, you know, if you can sell a kilowatt hour of electricity for X amount of money and it's costs four cents from solar and six cents from natural gas, or coal, the business case is easy to make. It hasn't worked out this way. There's a question about, um, is there a mechanism in place to monitor it? Kind of, there's supposed to be a global stock take, meaning they're gonna, they're gonna measure how we're doing uh, by next year on mitigation, adaptation, and the finances. Um, that's, gonna be, that's gonna make next year's COP another contentious one. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there and, and give time for other questions. Very, and other very good. Yeah, I'll bring out of time, John. There's a lot more that we need from you. We're going to have to do this kind of session again when you come back from Alaska. But that's another issue for to be discussed on another day. Melody, you've provoked a lot of interest from the students and, and others. Uh, some of them I know have to head off to classes in, in, in a short while, but they, you've provoked a lot of interest about developing countries and their role and, and the weaknesses of um, institutions within developing countries and so forth. And I wonder if you'd like to take on any, some, put those all together and kind of make a, a concluding comment on the, on the role of the developing countries where many of our global centers, including my own here in Rio, are located. 
Thank you. Yeah, indeed. And, and I really appreciated the comment actually on uh, on weak systems in place, weak institutional systems in place in, in many countries. And so that's part of the request. And that's actually also part of why um, there's this need for climate finance, the, the climate finance promises to be met, because there's a lot that needs to happen at country level. And that includes things like capacity building. And But there's a lot of institutional mechanisms that have to be put in place and countries need support for that. And I mean, on a bit of a tangent, but still related to that, we see that very much in the work that we do because we work a lot with meteorological departments in different countries that are producing climate information and then uh, different other sectors that are in need for climate information to respond to the, the climate impacts that they're seeing. And very often, you know, there is this, there is a, a strong limitation in the capacity of um, some of these institutions to be able to produce information and disseminate and tailor information to all the people that need it at the scale that is needed. That's just a small example of an institutional challenge that countries are facing in just how they produce climate information. And that's so critical for adaptation. So I, I really uh, value that comment. And um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think it's, it's absolutely included in the demands. Um, there are a number of comments on different things. I just wanted to briefly go back to the one on Article 6, which is the, the one on uh, carbon offset. Uh, that's not my my area of focus, but it is a big uh, challenge at this COP because it was very much discussed in the last COP. Basically, the Kyoto Protocol was allowing countries to basically countries to pay uh, other countries in order to be allowed to emit more, and that's something that uh, is still very blurry in the Paris Agreement. So we need to finalize whether that's allowed or not, and under what circumstances, and how does that work. And obviously, this is a contentious issue because it could generate a lot of funding. But at the same time, we absolutely want to avoid this to be a way to create what some people call, call, call uh, hot air, which is basically just um, you know, a financial mechanism that in the end doesn't lead to any emission reduction because you're just paying to be allowed to emit more. When what we really need at this point is very strong uh, emission reductions. So... Um, I hope that answers that question. And um, yeah, I think we're we're running ahead of uh, uh, you know, we're running out of time. But um, you know, you can always email us if you're interested. I, I will, we're going to curate these questions uh, and try to get back to you if we can in our uh, the best of our ability afterwards. But thank you so much, all the uh, members of the audience. So it's my turn to say thanks to everybody um, here. As I said at the beginning, it takes a village to solve the solve uh, to put this webinar together. As just as it takes a, a global community to to deal with the crises that uh, you three have done so much to uh, enlighten us about. But just a quick round of thanks first to Karen Poniacic, the Global Center in Santiago, which is not is behind the scenes making all this happen and, and put this all together. And uh, I wanna thank them in particular as well, all my counterparts in, uh, in uh, the nine global centers around the world. I'm certain we've had students and, and uh, others from each one of those centers around the world, even from China and India, where the time zone is very unfavorable, but they've been here and I want to thank them for that. I want to thank again the undergraduate Global Engagement Office under Dean Shannon Marcus for making this available to your students. So we really are counting on them to be leaders. I don't think they have a choice that some of them are going to have to move in this direction if the world is going to uh, avoid the, the the, the dire uh, circumstances of, of global warming. And then finally, and most directly and importantly to the IRI, I hope among many other things, we've all become aware of those of us in the broader Columbia community of what the International Research Institute for Climate and Society does. It's kind of, at least as I recall, it's kind of remote out there in the Montgomery campus, uh, a little bit off the main campus, so maybe off the radar screens for many of us uh, at, uh, at Columbia, but no more. The secret is uh, if it were hidden, it's out now. And we're hoping that we'll be able to call on you, John, uh, you Walter, you Melody in the future as we, uh, as you just, just as you say, we follow up and stay together as a community of learners uh, uh, following, following Glasgow. You've done so much to show us the benefits of staying together. So please, that's, uh, I think that's it for me. If I've forgotten to mention anyone, please forgive me, but I do hope to see you again. And I want to finally say, bon voyage. I hope we don't miss your airplanes because I've kept you a little bit late. Uh, later than this uh, in this webinar, I don't think I have, but uh, have a wonderful trip there and uh, um, look forward to talking to you individually when you come back. Thanks. Thanks very, very much. <laughs>